Hello, everybody. Welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colwyn Way, um, and today it's good. It's going to be one of those sessions. So every now and again, you get something that you really, really enjoy turning, and wet turning for me is one of those things. Um, and I specifically today wanted to look at um, wet oak or green oak, as we know it. Um, the reason being that green oak is, I don't know, it's it's one of those timbers that needs to be treated with a little bit more respect in terms of its tannic acid content. Um, it's things like um, rusting anything it touches. If it's not um, uh, made of, of stainless, for instance, it'll blue your hands, it'll rust your tools, all those sorts of things. I just wanted to talk about that because it catches quite a lot of people um, unawares. Um, and it's not the only timber. So we'll, we're, we're going to talk about that as we go through it. So like I say, welcome everybody to our, our workshops here at Woodworking Wisdom. We've got Ben behind the camera um, or cameras. Uh, asking questions as well so we've already been looking at what you've been talking about online whilst whilst we've been get preparing and getting ready i do apologize if we're a little bit late this morning i just wanted to get everything really um <laughs> prepared and there's a couple of things i forgot last minute so um this is what we're going to make we're just going to make a little um oak a little wooden pot really it's a little oak pot it's a fairly simple design this one um a little rocking pot it's it's very very thin um, we will see a little bit of light through it in a minute if we can if I can get the angle just right on camera two there, Ben, if, that, if you would. You can just see a little bit of light coming through the bottom, okay, and through the sides. But that's where we're, we're trying to aim for, nice and thin, because what I want from this piece is I want it to, to move. So um, this was turned this morning. And, and by the way, everybody, we are trying wherever possible now to, to run a supporting blog for the video so you'll be able to see a few more steps and, and the written word also in the steps that we're making so this was to support that this is going to be a blog that's going to support this video um oak is my chosen material because of its tannic acid like i said and um, i'm just using a simple form here because allowing that simple form then to move and become um become its own thing really create its own design is is where we're going going to you may have seen on the image to support the video that, that i had three or four um, earlier made pots there they've all warped and gone really really funky in their shape as well so so that's what we're going going for and this board that i've or the board that i cut these blanks out of was a cover board so it went to the timber yard and uh, i saw this cover board if you don't know what a cover board is a cover board is that that sort of hat of timber um that what the first or the last slice that they take off the tree when they're milling um, and they tend to put that board on the top once they restack the the um, boards to to dry with sticks in between. They put that board on the top to stop the weather from getting at the bare planks. So with the bark on the outside, still so that's called a cover board. And this lovely cover board was there. It's about four inches uh, thick. Um, I asked. I said, "Can I can I pinch that one? Do you really need it?" Um, and we replaced the cover board with another bit of timber. And I and I took it. And um, the reason I wanted it, it was a particularly beautiful bit of oak it's really really strong medullary rays in this particular piece it also had quite a lot of um a, quite a lot of burrs in there as well the bit we're using today doesn't have that many burrs but you can you can sort of see the strong medullary rays that are creeping through it um and it's just a really really nice piece of timber to turn quite a strong difference between its sap and its heartwood here um and when it comes to turning it you'll see through the sap much easier than when your heartwood um, there's far more sap running through the sap. Um, so quite simply with this one, we're going to turn it between centers, create a point, a uh, hole point for the, um, for the chuck. And in that hole point, it will be sacrificial. Okay. So we, we are going to, um, we are going to sacrifice it. Now, just very briefly, I can see there's a few questions coming. Um, you saw me take this out of a, a plastic bag simply because I cut all these pieces of timber up three to four weeks ago and with the, the the idea that I was going to turn them fairly quickly but I lined them up for different demonstrations and if I just left those bare um, exposed to the, the 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 environment they would crack they would split in these areas here on the end grain which obviously we don't want um, so I sealed them to stop them drying now do be a little bit careful about that already you can see a little bit of um um, sort of decay, a little bit of mold growing on them. And the, the mold will colour the timber, especially if you're using um, paler timbers. But it's needed. I've got a couple of bits, a couple of bits of acacia here for natural edges that I've done exactly the same thing. Just just 
put them in a plastic bag. Um, they will last like this. Even a plastic bag, you can keep them in there for sort of, I would say, six weeks, but you would need to keep aerating them to get rid of that mold. I mean, you can put them in paper bags with shavings, all those sorts of things, but the same thing. You need to keep turning them over. It's not a long-term strategy. It's a short-term strategy until you either rough turn or thin turn, which we're going to talk about today. Yes, Ben, sorry, I'm waffling. Carry on. Yeah, that's great. Um, so just a couple of uh, folks in here, Cohen, saying um, they saw you in Cardiff last week and really enjoyed the demos. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I was doing um, a similar thing. The last demo in Cardiff was a, the wet oak turning. That bowl that I turned at the, the store has turned brilliant. It's almost like an egg. It's turned completely oval. So it's done exactly what I was hoping it would do. So that was uh, Malcolm and Robert. They said uh, to say hi and, and say, uh, yeah. enjoyed it. Um so Bob's asking about um, info on the blog. Is that is it just general information on this um, demonstration, or yeah? So it's going to be a, it's a cut down version of what we're doing here. So it's uh, little bullet points with supporting photographs, just a, a reminder and and the prompts for the video. So they're to go in in line with with the videos. Um, I'll, what I'll do is we'll get more information as as we as we do these, and I'll bring them to you every time. Um, so I think we've got another live on Thursday, so we'll we'll give you we'll update you a little bit of information on that. But it's all going to be on the info tab on the the main home screen of the Axminster um, Tools page. So if you go to um, right at the top right hand side, there you'll see it's uh, what was it called? How tos videos blogs. I have to I'll have to double check myself, but have a go at the top right corner. You'll see. All the information. You put me on the spot again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, put me on the spot. Uh, so, a uh, question from Gordon. He's asking, what moisture content are we talking about for green timber? Um, so, cut the tree down and turn it. That would be the best, the best answer. Um, you know, if you cut a tree, if you're lucky enough to be in the position of cutting trees, cutting trees down and all that sort of thing, then um, you can turn it straight away. Um, and I would call that that green timber, that that green turning and, and wet turning. Um, you could wait for um, six months, then plank the tree and turn it. That would be green turning because the tree won't start to dry that significantly within six months if it's left whole. Um, in board form, different story. That's why you, trees are planked, so they, they dry quicker. Just a general rule there, and it's very general because different timbers are dry, different drying times. Um, the general rule is a year per inch plus one. So a year per inch plus one, all that means is a two inch board, three years to dry, three inch board, four years to dry and so on. Until you get to sort of five to six inches and then they never really dry in the center core. Um, you get a lot more splitting, the thicker you go, all those sorts of things. That's why rough turning is so important to us as wood turners. A lot of the time, um, wet timber can be cheap or dry uh, cheap or free um and it means that we can turn a uh, rough turner bowl let's say 16 inches across by six or seven inches deep and that bowl will be ready to return within a year where if we go by the year per inch plus one rule it would be seven to eight years before it would be dry enough to turn you know so for us it's a huge huge thing much cheaper way of working uh, much quicker way of working as well all right. Different parts of the world, you're going to experience different drying times. Of course you are. Um, but that is the general rule. Now, let's get this between centers. Any more questions before we carry on there, Ben? No, we're good. What I've just noticed here is I've got quite a lot of very soft um, bark on the top surface. So let me just make sure I'm safe when we start turning through this. Um, what I might just have to quickly do is just do a little bit of a drill. Ben, can you just get me a fairly large drill bit, say 25 to 30 mil out of the drawer? And I'm just going to disappear off the camera just while I make a... Do I need it? Because, and I'm going to show you all in a moment, um, what I need to do with this is just turn away this bark. I need to make sure that we are there we are look you can see how much bark has come away that's this here so i'm at solid timber there thank you ben um oh yeah that one there perfect what you could do is drill down okay um and then that will create a nice little flat for you then to use a four prong drive or, or a drive center of some sort um but that's on an angle i would need to support that in a pillar drill i can't just do that with my 
uh, now I've removed the bark, I can see I can't just do that with my uh, hand drill. So what I'm going to do is put the tail sock, I'm going to put a little brother mark in here, tail sock center in there, um, and then this will be the back of the bowl, and I'll create a little sacrificial foot in a minute. I'll have to take away quite a lot of this material. So, but we can do that, you know. So number one is being safe. I want to make sure that this stays on the lathe, and I'm just using the bridle just to center up as best I can. So we want to be about, let's go about, about there. Little bridle mark. That then should pick up on my ring center, and we need a drive to the other side let's go nice and big so i'll go a jumbo drive don't know what a jumbo drive is that's a jumbo drive um it's around about 40 millimeters across that will go there i'll re i'll just dab with the bridle the other end there. now find that hole there it is. sorry my eyes can pick that up for a minute Bring my light around, just give me some something to aim for. There it is. And I'm gonna make sure that, that protrudes that gets in there quite a way. All right, ring center, just so it's not slipping off, it's creating its own little hole point. There we go. Yes, Ben, that's what I'm setting up. Um, we've got a question from uh, Woody. Um have you protected the um, the machine bed no. from the tannic acid? No. What my plan is, and I do this every time um, I'm using wet timber. Um, well, I say no. It's always protected in a way because I've got camellia oil. Get that out of the way. Camellia oil, camellia oil or uh, wood wax always on the bed because that's helping me um, lubricate the bed and, and have the slideways moving nicely. Um but you're dead right. This is where we're going with today's demonstration, actually. The tannic acid in, in um, oak is quite aggressive. If you left that piece of oak on the bed of the lathe overnight, it would pit. It wouldn't just rust. It would pit the bed. It was that, it was that caustic to your to work. Same with face plates. Don't leave face plates on, um, on your work. If they're not stainless steel, they will corrode very, very quickly. Your hands now, we're touching the oak. So we've got tannic acid on our hands. Um, then we're touching the steel of our tools. So the steel is going to go blue and our hands are going to go blue. That's the reaction between the acids in our skin, the acids in the wood and the, and the steel itself. So if you're in a job where you, you need to be shaking hands fairly um, frequently, a bit of barrier cream will help. won't completely stop it, um, but it will certainly help. So those are the things to be aware of. Um, it, you know, it can work to your advantage if you wanted to color your timber afterwards. A solution of vinegar and wire wool brushed on um, would turn this black. It's a really quick way of aging oak. Um, you'll see if you've left your timber fairly wet, your fingerprints will be there as blue marks um, 24 hours later. So just, just think about things like that. Um, when I leave the bed, uh, well, sorry, when I leave the lathe um, after my day's work with the, the timber, everything gets a wipe down. And that includes things that you may not think about. So the quill of the, the tail stock, um, the stems of your lathe the internal part of your banjo okay and i know i'm talking about these and i've got a you know a stainless steel tool rest and all that sort of stuff not everybody has so it's still a good habit to get into the other thing of course is the steel of your tools if you don't want them to get blue but it's always good you know with wet turning will uh, um, create an incredible amount of sap on the tools wet sap which then dries to, uh, to quite a hard substance so wipe it off when you can when it's nice and, and easy to wipe off so when you leave the workshop before you do anything um, and i can't emphasize enough the mess it makes of a lathe if you don't uh, don't do that so lay speed to zero and we're going to use a 3-8 bowl gouge to start with and i'm going to create a foot that i'm then going to grip and that foot will be sacrificial it's going to i'm going to take it off the end because it's going to be a little rocking pot so lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on, and I know how insecure that um, that side can be, so I'm just going to create my foot first. There we are, that's running at 1100 revs, so just gently take off the excess. And I'm sure the question is going to come is why aren't you using a roughing gouge? 
this isn't a piece of spindle work. The grain is not going that right direction. The grain isn't running through the piece. It's running up and down the piece. Okay. So that's quite important. Then we would never use a spindle gouge on this type of thing. It's, it's just like a bowl, a bowl blank. Okay. So no, no spindle roughing gouges on this one. stop and double check adjust the tool rest and whilst we've stopped let's take a look at that wonderful grain that we've got going on in this bit of timber it's really really pretty stuff i'm gonna just adjust the camera ben and i'm going to come in a little bit closer just so everybody can see that nice grain okay so we're almost down to a cylinder there you can see a couple of flats that's fine um, but what i want to do now is get down to what my where my foot will be. I'll take the opportunity just to tweak that tail stock. going to look like I'm taking a huge amount of timber away but what I need to be able to do is get past that bark but I think I've still got a fair ways to go you can still see it here so we've got to get rid of that that it won't do us any favors keeping it on there it's just not strong enough Just double check and see if I'm far enough. Then we can decide what jaw we're going to use. So we've still got quite a lot more actually to come away. So another cut, just the tool rest. That looks like solid timber I can see. Yeah, we're good. So now let's get rid of the rest of the bark. Double check. Yeah, we're in the solid timber there now. So look, look at all this. You can see where that center is, that live center now. So we've got a nice bit of solid center. Um, jaws, what jaws should I use? I'm going to go for the O'Donnells. Then he goes for these. Um, nice small grip on those. So let's just measure that. We'll cut that, cut that in then. So internal dovetail in this case. I'll give you an idea of what that measurement is. We are looking at ooh, just under an inch and three quarters. So actually in millimeters, we're looking about 43 mil. All right, so how much more do I have to take off? Probably about another three sixteenths to five mil off of there. We are. Now it's going to be a dovetail. Just want to make sure the underside is nice and clean. Remember, this will be sacrificial. It will not be part of the finished piece. Little dovetail going in. The O'Donnells. That's it. And as well as the dovetail, what we've got is a little register. And I just want to show you. Um, camera can't quite see really, but we've got the dovetail and then I've got a little flat area that the top of the jaw can register up against. Just helps keep everything nice and true. Uh, yes, Ben, we've got a question. Um, so a question from Fuller here. He says it's a bit off topic, but he's um, he's watched a Richard Raffan vid. Yeah. And, um, and he's using an asymmetric grind on his bowl gouge. Um, 
other than saving a few seconds changing tools, is there really any advantage to the asymmetric uh, grind? It, well, no, that is the advantage of it. it the, the fact that you just twist that tool and you get a different um, you get a different angle. So you'll see me you'll see me when we do the inside of bowls a lot of the time. I'll start off by having the handle over here, okay, flute facing around about the two o'clock position. As we push down the center. I'll then open the gouge up a little bit. So flute facing upright because I've got a slightly different angle on my left hand wing. And that will allow me to get further around that corner before finally coming back again and twisting back in. So, yeah, they are really useful because halfway through a cut, you don't want to be swapping tools around. Um, so if that's if that's why he's using or if that's the sort of grind he's using, then that would be the reason. It does really help. Um, I wouldn't have thought it make much difference in terms of production turning things like that, um, because most turners will will twist the tool to to get the different angle. But um, that's that's why I would use it. Right, shape. Let me just take off this extra little flat. I'm actually going to turn the final shape before holding it in the truck, which I don't normally do, but I want to do it on this piece just because. I'm going to cover a little bit of that base up with the jaw. So I want to be clear of vision. There we are. So if we get this back curve done, and I'm using the bevel because I'm actually going to sand this even though it's wet. I'll start the drying process by sanding. So I want bevel rubbing. Nice clean finish. This is going to be a little rocker, a little rocking pot, bowl, whatever. Not really to, to store anything. It's more of a, a decorative piece. a little bit of a flat in there look now I, what i don't want is any just sort of changes of direction i don't want any lumps bumps things like that just tidy at the top edge um, i don't want any lumps and bumps in there because i'm going to sand it now and this is wet it doesn't sand well um it clogs up the paper and trying to sand detail would be a bit of an issue um i, know, I didn't even look at that bit of timber then i was about to say what a lovely bit of wood because i know it is a lovely bit of wood it's coming off the chisel so nicely um that it's did it just it's I said at the beginning, one of those projects that's a pleasure to turn. There's a hole here. That is not woodworm. That's a little beetle RV. I'm not worried about it. It's, it's dead. It's not in there. Um, if it was, just a quick blast and the microwave sorts that out. Yes, Ben. Um, so a question here from the sleeping dog. Um, he's been asked to make a salt rimmer, um, which is a flat bowl full of salt. For dipping cocktail glasses into oh, okay um he's not sure whether um should oil it or leave it natural i'd probably uh, leave it natural absolutely um i don't know what a choice of timber is going to be i'd immediately go for something like a maple or a sycamore or a beech um i know i keep it natural yeah one of those uh then nothing can react then at all if you were going to use oil not a problem but just leave it really well to dry so i would leave it before you you use it for the first time a good week for those oils just to completely dry out for you all right but yeah nice little project that one okay well, it's a bit of sanding i know it's wet but i am going to turn dust extraction on because we're starting to dry the external um surface as well so dust extraction going on and what i want to get rid of you can see them in the camera there's there's a lot of lines here so as I start sanding, I'm actually drying this external surface out. That's going to help in getting rid of any of those lines, any tears that there might be. What you will experience when you're sanding wet timber like this is clogging of the paper. So 
Um, just every now and again, a bit of a tap out. If you wanted to use um, any sanding uh, materials like Abronet with the holes in, that's going to do two things for you. It's going to help declog um, and help keep the timber cool. There we are. So this is 100. I am going to work all the way up to 400. And I would only do this for, for fairly small projects. I can't... It takes an awful long time with large pieces. You'll get for a lot of abrasives with large pieces as well. So, but this sort of thing is fine. I'm going to stop a couple of times before we finish, just to make sure. Because it's not so much the scratches I'm looking to get rid of at this stage, it's the turning lines. And you can still see a few. They're just a little bit more stubborn on, on wet timber. Really nice. I know I keep saying that. Lovely bit of timber. Have another look. It's really striking. These Madrolia rays, I've never seen these before. They're coming through the um, the heartwood, right into the sap. There's little little veins. Yes, Ben. So got a couple of questions, Cohen. Um sorry, the first one was from Bob let P. Me, hang on, let me turn okay, <laughs> sorry. Let me turn these I don't want to shout in the microphone. Go for it. First one uh, from Bob P. He's asking, is this a a calabash shaped bowl? Yeah, that's it's it. Good. It is. It is. I take a lot of my my shapes, inspiration, and things like that from um, pottery books, um, from uh, old pottery. So if you go to a museum, things like that, and you look at old pottery shapes. Um, even woven baskets. I'm doing a project next week about the basket weave effect. And it's nice when you research. We were, we're all here in privileged positions that we get to um, present to you a different project every week. So we get to do an awful lot of research and we can get to look at other people's work. One of my big inspirations at the moment is a fairly new turner, actually. Um, and him and his partner, they they have set this uh, Instagram um, uh, post up, or not post up, sorry, Instagram and page up um, Ash and Plum. And I would ad advise just take a look at their work and and um, and follow them. They they do some really, really quite cool shapes. And they are, their inspiration, obviously, is, is uh, comes from natural pottery and things like that as well. But they do some interesting things. And it's people like that that I follow. And they're fair. Well, he's, uh, Barnaby Ash is a fairly young um, Turner as well, so he's he's uh, he's someone that I'm just keeping an eye on because I, I love his work so much. But yeah, that and and pottery and and um, whether it's African art, um, Aboriginal art, um, any any sort of um, you know sort of native pottery is just a real inspiration for me. So that's where I get all these sorts of things from. It's just they're just pretty shapes, nothing contemporary in there at all. And then uh, a question from Jim. He's asking about the bevel angle on your skew. So I'm at the moment I'm working with a 55. I'll I'll go a little bit um, sort of more severe. So even we'll put that angle all the way back up. I'll have a bottom feeder for the center. Bottom feeder for when we turn the bottom, really, only because if you, if you think about this shape here, we're coming in on itself. So trying to move that handle all the way around, I'll start. Um, uh, impacting the, the rim if I come too far around the handle. So you need that angle um, less in the bottom. Um, so, yeah. So, Cohen, your um, your signature skew, I think he means, your bevel oh, signature angle. signature skew is 25 degrees um, it's out the box. So 25 degrees. As you get better and better, then the angle can come back maybe to, tw maybe to sort of 20 degrees. Um, but, yeah, and we're talking a single bevel angle on one side. So, yeah, about about 25 degrees works. Like I say, the finer you get it, the more, the better finish you'll get. 
Um, but the more aggressive and the a little bit more twitchy they become. Okay. And Jim's also asking Cohen, he's doing a um a project of casting a dried out Brussels sprout um in uh, in resin. Is that Jim? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there anything you can use to stabilize it? The Brussels sprout. The Brussels sprout. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're better off at answering that because I know you you've tried encapsulating bugs as a sort of beetles yeah. and things like that, and you you've come up with a few things and flowers as well. I I'll let you answer it first, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll um. So I found I, with the bugs, they need to be really dry, yeah. um, so you can't have any moisture content in it. So I guess. We need to really dry that out, but I'm not sure how the color will survive on a Brussels sprout. Um, but sometimes um, with the things that caught little air pockets like the bugs, you could you dip them in the resin first and that kind of coats them. And then you kind of put them in the pot or to cast them or anything like that. But yeah. What did you use last time? Was it polyester resin? It was a really strong smelling one. Polyester resin. So I think, um, I think it's... Uh, epoxy resin which works better with encapsulating I'll, um, I'm pretty sure on that one and then it may be a particular type uh, I'm, I'll am i find out more about that because it's something that I'm quite interested in is encapsulating maybe flowers and things to answer your question Jim um, I, I'm I'm not the one to ask I've never I've never tried doing it with a Brussels sprout person thanks for the question though you're going to get a lot of people answering and, and uh, giving suggestions, I'm sure. So 150 grit now. Now let's just stop and take a look. That was 150, so I want to have no lines. We're good. That's good. I'm really tough with that. Please. That's looking pretty. So let's go to 240. Now, arguably the, the external part of this little pot is going to be the easy bit to sand. It gets harder toward the inside because you're not your bevel rubbing is a little bit tougher. Your finish is not going to be quite as good. Uh, what was that? That's 240. So I'm just going to jump straight into a 400. There we go. Good. All right. Just before, let's turn that extractor off. Just before um, I finish and turn this one over, let's just take that last little bit of waste by the tailstock sensor down as far as we can which won't be as as far as it would be if I was on my own with no one watching. Right, let's just... There we are, just using a little quarter-inch bowl gouge there, which I'm going to keep out because I'm going to use it, I think, in a minute. Um, let's turn this piece over. Already... This is starting to blue. I don't know whether whether you can pick that up. There we are. You can see the muck that's coming off of that. If I, I put on my hand, you can see it's black. That's literally where it's turning blue from the reaction. And all the sap is really collecting heavily on the inside there and drying quite quickly, actually. So it's just a consideration, you know. My All my tools look used, um, as, do, as does my... My lathe. And we're going with those drawers, the little SK100. dovetail in there 
I left that a little bit too big, really, but we're, we're going to cope with it. Tail stock's going to come off. I need that out my way because I want to be able to swing the handle of my gouge around. So I've got to, got to have movement around this way. So the tail stock, if it were here in this part, it would just be in the way. I'd start clunking things. Um, so just to start, we're just gently removing center. Lay speed to zero because we've changed a lot on the lathe. So lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. I'll bring the light around, try and keep out the way of the cameras. There we go. Lay speed up now. That's 1600 revs at the moment. Already getting a little bit of build up on that tool rest. If that was causing cause me a problem, I'd get rid of it, but I think it's okay for the minute. So what I might have to do is sharpen the, the gouge again. I've got a spare one there, but uh, we'll see how we go. doing here really is just taking some of the bulk away taking some of the bulk away before I start looking at thickness I need to leave some strength in there so I'm not going to go too far And we need to be fairly mindful, well, not fairly, we need to be mindful of, is that going to get in everyone's way? Just pop that, well, I'll make sure the light doesn't get in the way too much. But still be able to see. Um, what was I talking about? Being mindful of, being mindful of thickness. Um, if I was in my workshop, just Pam, go back to number one camera a second then, would you? If I was in my workshop, what I'd be doing now, and no one was watching, um, what I'd be doing now is just pivoting that headstock around so I don't have to be leaning over the bed of the lathe. I, what I found is even after sort of 20 minutes, um, my back starts to tell me that it's actually un uncomfortable. Um, and at the end of the day, the back would be screaming. So just by standing up straight again, by having that pivot, that pivot of the headstock is a really nice thing to be able to do. Either that or headstock right up to this point. So then you can stand at this point of the lathe. So right on the end of the lathe, um, that really helps your back for long periods. Yes, Ben. Um, <clears throat> Brand's asking, what percentage of the bowls dry properly? He says, hey, I was wondering what percentage of the bowls dry properly. So I guess do they do some of them split and some of them warp or once you once you get to the thickness that we're gonna go, rarely you're gonna get a split unless there's one in there already. And if you do get a split, um, then work it. Make it into a feature. Okay, and that feature can be stitching, it can be um, sanding and making that the prominent side so everybody's looking at it and knows that that is your feature then. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do with it. And pl pl people like, um, or, or sites like um, Ash and Plum will give you a good idea of how it's done well, you know. Don't copy, but use them as inspiration. Um, give them a nod, give them a follow, all those sorts of things. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions just come through. James is asking, um, do you ever fume the bowls um, after turning? Because they presumably turn quite dark because they're green. Um, I don't fume. What? There's several other things you can do. I mean, I get fuming. I understand. No problem. But um, no, I don't. These I like these for, for the most to stay the natural color. 
sometimes I will um, brush them with vinegar and wire wool if I want them to go really dark. And that's a really cool finish. That's a really cool look as well. Once you've done that, just give them a buff with some wax um, and, and, uh, and, and maybe a brass brush, something like that, just to bring the grain out even more. But no, I've never fumed, really. I know Jason's done a little bit um, in our um, chess table. He's, he fumed the, the chess board. But no, not myself. Yes, ma'am. And then Jay's asking, do you ever turn in reverse to ease the stress on your back? No. No. So again, it's something I've never done. Um, I've been experimenting with reverse turning recently because we've just developed the ASL locking ring for people that want to turn in reverse and reverse sand and all those sorts of things. So I've been doing it, but I've been using it more for sanding than turning. Um, but, but yeah, but and it's not something I've done. And then Cliff's asking, what do you mean by stitching? Stitching. So stitching is where? Now, that can be, stitching can mean lots of different things. Stitching or butterflies. Butterflies and tables will mean little um, blocks of timber in, the, in a rough shape of a butterfly. They're more dicky by ties, that sort of thing. Um, so you route that shape out and put that in. Stitching in bowls would be either um, uh, copper wire, brass wire, uh, leather, nylon, all those things. Um, literally stitched so either side of the crack um, and used as decoration or to physically hold something together. So um, metal spikes sometimes used in end boards. If, they, if you want to stop an end board from splitting too far up, you put a couple of metal spikes in that are joined so they're that sort of shape and you thump them in, that'll, that'll stop. But stitching generally in wood turning is a decorative thing and it just emphasizes the floor, um, so turning into a feature. Bringing the shape around now, I can start thinking about thickness. We're going to go to around about two mil. So I'm going to stop about there because what I don't want to do is have the thickness, have it the same thickness all the way down this section. If I do that, I'm going to lose the strength up here to be able to hold that thickness. So I'm going to start using a set of calipers. But I, what I don't want to do here is, is down to the overall thickness and start sliding that up and down the outside edge because I'll scratch it. So I'm going to open it slightly. Um, so bigger, so probably about double the thickness of the top at the moment. And then I'm just going to push forward. I'm look at how the gap changes between its outer section, outer pin here, um, and the timber. And um, at the moment, I'm nowhere near right. So we, we're going to change a few things, and I'm going to come a bit thinner. Ben, let me know if I'm standing in the way of any, my elbows get in the way, let me know because I'll try and contort my body to suit the cameras. So let's, I, I can feel that I'm getting thicker the further down I go, but I just want to check how much by uh, with the calipers. So we're, we're good to that point. So I got about an inch before I need to take about, before I need to take any more away. Again, we're just going to check. That's getting better. Still a little bit thick. So what I'm going to start doing is bringing that bottom curve around a bit more.
I don't care how um, how confident and how many of these you've done. You can't help but twitch a little bit when you come around that bottom corner. <laughs> um, there's a, still a little bit of a lump as it's much thicker um, as I come around, but I don't know whether we'll be able to pick this up. And where you can see a little bit of light through there, we're getting we're getting to it a good thickness. But like I say, it's only the sap that seems to become translucent. The the heartwood doesn't. So, yes, Ben. Um, so I've got a question here from Malcolm. He's asking. Um, he says, "Please explain how he can lock an SK one one four chuck to turn in reverse." So you would need well, you're two reasons, two ways really. Um, so you, if you have um, the extended nose version, I don't have one here. Extended nose. Let's go camera number three then. So this is your ASR locking ring, ASR locking ring version. So that has that little groove section there, and that has a ring that goes over the top. Now that only works with a lathe that has a corresponding uh, fixture. Alternatively, you have the extended nose version of either the 114 um, or the 100 that has side grub screws, which you lock on in a conventional way. So those are the two ways. All right. Let's get that corner done. You can see a little lump. I'm just going to get in the way of camera just for five seconds then. So I'm trying to keep that bevel rub, rubbing all the way around that bottom. We're starting to get the right thickness now. The lump is gone. That I could feel. That's good. Happy with that. So one more, <laughs> that one more cut again. One more cut on that bottom curve. And then we're going to take the bottom out. Good, done. Make sure I don't give myself any surprises and understand the thickness of the bowl I'm working on. Get my fingers in there, pinch, use your calipers. You shouldn't be under any surprises. When you get to this point, you're yeah, good, happy, happy, happy. So bevel rub, really important. Get that bevel rubbing. So before I look in there, I'm just going to check my fingers first, just to make sure that the cut is smooth. Then I'm going to check with the calipers again. And we're good. I'm happy. That's got the same thickness all the way through. Um, the base is going to come off, but that's going to be my rocking section. Um, so I can just carry on and do a bit of sanding in there now. I'm going to get some fresh paper. Um, Ben, can you just go to number three a minute? I just want to show everybody. The bowl is in the way, but in a minute when I take it off, you'll see these splatter marks. That's sap, okay? Direct sap. So tannic acid that's just hitting the lathe. That'll just be sanded off in a minute. Um, and then a bit more camellia oil on it. Yes, Ben. Um, so a question here from Malcolm. <clears throat> He's asking, can you post fit the locking collar to the SK114? Sorry, so so can, you, can you could you fit one of those collar fittings on the on a old one one four, or does it have no. to be machined as part? of uh, Yeah, because the one one fours are um, machined as one. 
piece. So the thread is all part of the outer part of the chuck. Um, so we do that purposely to stop any inaccuracies creeping in. So no, unfortunately, that is uh, that is a separate chuck. And then Brian's asking, um, are there jobs out there for production turners and are they hard to get? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, in this country, yes, there are. I know a few um, production turners that are out there. Um, are they hard to get? Yes, they are. Um, it's not a job that's, that you can just walk into. But if you're an accomplished turner and you're, you're, you're wood turning anyway, set yourself up, make sure people know what you're doing, that you can production turn. Um, and then, yeah, it doesn't take, it's not an overnight thing, but people start to know you, local builders, um, local furniture makers, you know, you'll, you may have to do a few of the other bits as well, sort of like the crafty stuff. So maybe some um, galleries, but it will come, it will come. Uh, eventually now if that's if we're talking uk i have no knowledge of um other countries and production turning um, that much anyway um so it'd be worth checking out the country you, you are base speed is relatively quick 1400 revs um dust extraction on and i just want to i'm going to work heavy with the, the 100 grit first just to take away any lines I've got in here. I want to eliminate those lines before I start thinking about scratches. All the time we're doing this, we're drying this piece out. We're starting that drying process. And I'll take this one indoors. Don't put it under direct heat. So don't put it on top of um, a radiator or on top of the mantle over the fire, that sort of thing. But the warmth of the house, if you turn thin, we'll dry these usually within about three days. And there'll be some funky shapes going on. Let's stop and have a check and see what we're dealing with a minute. Do you know, the timber's just looking after me. It's just, um, it's a really nice bit of wood, this one. It's helping me out in the sanding. It's not causing me too many problems. A little bit of a round top. Now we're on a, a 150 grit. Right, let's go on to um, a 240 and a 400. Tell you what, we'll have a treat, we'll go to a new piece. Oh, 
That's the 240, now the 400. piece of that so what we can do now if we flip that one out we'll turn him over and take off that foot so rid of that whilst we've got that there I should be able to get the white out of the way show you a little bit uh, how am I going to make this work sorry Ben that's, that's how I make it work, isn't it? Let's try and get it around so you can see the inside. There we are. You can just start to see that, that light coming through. The sap only, you know, it's not actually working on the heart, but the sap you can start to see right the way through. So that's... That's nice and thin, happy with where we are with that one. What I want to do now is just hold a little piece of timber in the chuck and then we'll remount that tailstock center on and take that foot away. Remember, this is a little rocking pot. So uh, let's just change chucks. Yes, whilst I'm doing that, Ben, do you want to shout your questions out? Yeah, so a few questions come in, Cohen. First one from Graham. He says um, that he turned some wet oak yesterday and the beds turned black. Tried meths and find em fine emeries. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you can use? Yeah. So, I mean, I've used, well, I tend to use, um, like, you, like you've done, um, clean it off first as much as you can with, with liquid, but then use um, very fine abrasive. Um, oh, oh, Garaflex is the other thing. I've got a little blocks of Garaflex, which I use with camellia oil. Spray the camellia oil and then use the Garaflex, especially the coarse one, which is a blue block. Um, which is a rubberized uh, rust cleaner. Okay, that's, that's the best way of describing it, really. It's an impregnated rubber block that you can then rub that off with. But if you embed it with some camellia oil at the same time, you're also putting um, sort of good oil back into that metal. So a bit of a bit of both, Garaflex and camellia. And then Martin's asking, um, Cohen, is there any reason that you're not using a bowl sander? Bowl sander. Um, not really, apart from it will clog up my... Um, little bowl sanding pads ever so quickly with the um, abrasive I can every now and again just take it out give it a good tap and a shake out and manipulate it a little bit and, and stop that from happening it's the only reason really I couldn't get a bowl sander into what I was doing also um, but yeah, that's the only reason yeah um, so would it uh, Robert's asking would it be better to tape some cardboard to the lathe bed to save cleaning yeah absolutely I mean that's a, a natural um sort of protection i i did you know i never bother i'm a, my lathe is my workhorse um i don't care what color the bed is uh, as long as i don't pit the bed then i'm happy um I'll say that slowly haven't you um <laughs> see, as long as you do, you know don't pit the bed then um all's good with me um, and most of the time, if I'm wet turning, it's it's because I've got a production run to do and we've taken a tree down or whatever. So I've got loads of things to do. So I'll put a sheet up around the rest of the workshop to retain the shavings from covering my shelves. Um, and, but apart from that, I just, just crack on and make sure I clean down when I break or when I, you know, at the end of the day, that sort of thing. And then the question from Jay, um, their brother keeps asking them for a usable wine cup. Any suggestions? Yeah, we've had this one before, and when it comes to add, adding wine to wood, not really that good. Um, but then again, if you think of wine casks, and again, talking tannins and tannic acids and stuff like that, um, then oak being the favourite timber for those. Uh, there's a, a fantastic Irish turner called Joe Laird, he makes whiskey um, tumblers and he does it in the old way, same way you would make a, a, a wooden oak cast. So he uses oak. And um, uh, you said the other day, Ben, about pinch pots. And what he does, he turns the 
the outside of the the oak flask um, all the way through and then uses the grain orientation going the other way plugs it lets the the um, piece shrink around it and then actually fires the inside of that tumbler um, to make it waterproof or whiskey proof so in the old-fashioned way the way you do um, uh, whiskey casks that works really well in terms of anything else what you would add um, to wood to make it waterproof I don't know there's certainly no oils will do that for wine or whiskies um, so unless you're plastic coating no. or anything like that I, I don't know is my honest and truthful answer and I looked at it quite a lot with the cuxa cup and you do get some cup uh, some woods that are antibacterial so that the uh, bacteria doesn't build up in it and stuff so oh, okay uh, but that was cherry and birch I think um, sorry, Colin, you're right. If I keep going, keep firing. Okay. Um, so Tom's asking, what grip did you start with and why not use a mesh like Abernet? No, that's what I was saying. Absolutely use Abernet. Um, I have to hand my Hermes. Um, I have some Abernet at home and it does work really well. You can, you can knock the, the, um, the build up out of it fairly quickly. Quite nice. Helps to keep the timber cool as well. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Abernet's fantastic stuff. Now, I'm just using what I've got to hand at the moment. There we are. That's good. Let's just soften that edge. And I'm just going to check this for a fit before we start. It's a lot, it is a nice rounded bottom, but it's not overly rounded. There we are. That's a good firm fit. What I don't want to do is have wood on wood, so we're going to put a little bit of tissue in between. No one's going to Newark this weekend out of us lot, are they? No. No, no not, not that I know of. Uh, Jason or yourself? No. No, I'm taking down a birch tree this weekend, Ben, uh, with my, with Finley, my, my boy. We're taking the birch tree. You're going to have some of the limbs for <laughs> for some, what are you making, pinch pots? Um, shrink pots. Shrink pots. Shrink pots. And we're going to create, we're creating an article. This is um, a, tr a birch tree that we're taking down um, in a very crowded landscape garden there's really pretty bushes and thing around it so finley's now qualified as a fortunately for me as a uh, he can climb trees he can cut trees cross cut fell all that sort of stuff so he's up the tree we're taking them down a bit at a time and then i'm going to do a little article for returning magazine hopefully in the future on converting trees what we, you know how we would go about it and what we would use each bit for and all those sorts of things so um, yeah, that's that's the weekend plan. So no Newark. So all I've done, look, we do is pinch that between centres. I'm going to very carefully take away the base. You can go through the bottom of a bowl quite easily on the bottom, as easily as you can from the inside. So a little bit of care, don't go too far. Um, that'll do. Again, I'd probably go a bit further if, if I was in the workshop on my own, um, but I'm not. I've got a couple of people watching, so we won't go too far. Um, I'm just gonna roughly sand, just a little bit. So 100, so now on to 150.
There we are, the 240. And we're finished with a 400. I'm just looking at the, the, the shape blends. It keeps flowing all the way around. So we don't have any flats or points. That's good, happy with that. I'm gonna keep the dust extraction on. You can take the pull saw and cut off um, some of that if you want to. You can pair some of it off with a carving tool. Um, just be careful if you're gonna do that though. If you start pairing off, you know, without it being held, watch your fingers. Um, and also you don't want to start breaking the bottom out. You want it to come out controlled. I'm just going to sand that bottom away for the minute. So I'm going to put the disc sander on. That's why we're just going to keep the extraction running. Play speed to zero. We're adding a different device now. So play speed to zero, then turn the lathe on. And I'm sounding at about a thousand revs on this disc. Um, this is a, a relatively coarse disc. It's about 120. Right, so we're almost there with that one. I do want to go finer now, though. So we're going to take that off. And I'm going to add another sanding disc. Well, let's just change my chuck a minute. Those jaws won't quite go down small enough. Be right with you, Ben. Two seconds. Pop that one on. We'll just add one of our small sanding pads from our, our rotary sander. I'll, um, I'll just sand this, Ben, and I'll come straight back to you. Let's go 180, I think. So 180 grit on the rotary there. A little bit faster because we're dealing with a smaller diameter sanding this. I'm just looking at that overall shape, making sure that it's not a point in any way or a lump in any way, blending it into that, that same curve. Right, that's good. Um, let's just quickly go to a 240 and a 400. Two seconds. So 400. So now I'm sanding with the grain rather than across it. Let's turn that off. There we are. I want to show you. So the finish that we're getting straight off of that, look. We've got a lovely clean finish. And we've got no signs of that, that pip. If I turn them over, we've got a curve running all the way around. The nice thing then, of course, with those, if we can see which side, go that side. It's a nice little rocking pot. It sits upright, but it's a nice little rocker. Okay. 
So really pleasant thing to do. That by the time I would have said by morning that we've gone fairly oval. So what happens with these, you can see the grain running this way. These sides pinch in a bit further. So it'll be a nice sort of oval shape by morning. And then in the third day, um, it'll be right the way over. So there. So Ben, did you have a few questions? Um, so there's a question here from uh, uh, Michael Lionart. Um, so he's been watching your demonstration and then suddenly thought, in a mad panic, we've run out to the shed because they turned some wet and green oak yesterday. Oh, right. Expecting to see that, um, you know, a bit of corrosion and stuff. Um, where's the next? Sorry, next bit. However, there's no signs of corrosion anywhere. Does that mean he wasn't turning oak? I would presume so, yes. Yeah, because if it was wet, if it was dry, no, not a problem. But if it was wet and it was on the metal surfaces, then it will it will definitely leave a mark. Yeah. So I, yeah, I presume it just wasn't wasn't oak or wasn't wet oak. And then the gentleman would, would turn and saying that he's at Newark. He's gonna have a pint for us. <laughs> <laughs> a pint, is that all? Oh. One each. <laughs> Oh, have a nice weekend, Mark. I hope it goes well. If anybody's at Newark, go and see Mark Beckett and give him hell from us. <laughs> <laughs> Donna's asking, is that red oak or white? Maybe. You're asking me questions that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Red oak or white. I don't, it's nice oak is what it is, Donna. It's nice oak. It's, it's, it's quite brown. Um, it's massive medullary rays in it. That, 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 that's quite striking. I love this. The way the rays just strike right the way through into that sapwood, that different colour, it's really pretty. Yeah, but I don't know. Is it honest answer to that one? All right. All good. One thing I was, I haven't mentioned it, but I was, I want to mention it is that uh, oak isn't the only material, of course, to have high concentrated tannic acid. So there are other timbers out there. Use one of them, and you'll come across. Um, colors in you that are really striking purples and mauves and blues that's because they've been in contact with either a barbed wire fence a nail or a, a bullet or anything like that that would that reacts with the acids olives another one that you get a lot of reaction with chestnut is again it's another one um, teak so those types of timbers you will get a lot of it but i've never come across a timber that that's quite as um uh, full of it is as certainly as wet oak anyway um so yeah but i like it i love working with the stuff one little trick that i used to do with the stuff was once it was wet i've turned it to that sort of a finish then just drizzle the top with uh, vinegar and then take some wire wool and just do that over the top of it just like you're sh you're um shaking a pepper pot over the top and those little sprinkles of wire then react and it can come out almost like a porcelain marking or a speckled egg sort of marking which is quite a pretty one um, then you just wipe it clean afterwards with some water let it dry and you've got those colors there forever um attila the hamster's asking is it only wet wood that you can take that thin no no you can take um pretty much anything you can take fairly thin softwoods don't like it they'll split quite quickly so they're not structurally sound enough um, as as some of the rot, so spalt into spalted timbers, for instance, you'll, you struggle with sometimes because they've got some very soft areas. Um, but as long as it's sound on start, so there's no splits or cracks running through it, you you could get away with it. Wet timber does perform better though. Now the reason wet timber performs better that sap that moisture in there carries the cut, so it it, it cuts more more like um, more like a hard cheese than a uh, than a hard chalk. That's probably a good way of, of describing it. All right, so it cuts beautifully. Um, but that that obviously will move. The other thing that we haven't discussed, I have discussed in previous videos, is rough turning. Like I said, if you, if you want a rough turn, so do the same thing that we've done today, but instead of turning it thin, turn it thick. Leave it, if you're turning a big bowl, turn it, you leave it up to an inch and a quarter. Um, a smaller bowl is down to an inch, just under. Let them dry. They'll be dry within six to six months to a year. Return them then at that point um whilst when they're dry and you've got a finished bowl um in record time so and that you'll find a lot of turners um do that to to get cheaper timber and to speed up the bowl um you know bowl drying process or timber buying process timber drying process 
All right then. So we're well over time on that one. I am sorry, everybody. That's a that's a long old um, uh, demonstration now, but I, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. That was a little treat for me, that one this time. So uh, next week, I'm going to be doing the basket weave vase. So instead of a bowl, we're going to do a basket weave vase. We're going to look at um, one of the new cutters from Easy Wood on that one. Um, and really uh, excited to be doing that one. Um, on uh, Thursday, though, I'm always going to do this. Ben, what are we doing on Thursday this week? It's Jason, isn't it, on Thursday? Um, I've got a creative carving one coming out. It's Jason's doing... Um, Sharp? No, he done his sharpening last sharpening. week. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should do our own work before we come on. Join us anyway on Thursday um, for more of the same. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. And, um, yeah, share us around. So thank you very much, everybody. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.